So this evening we're studying the altar of incense. When I was in year nine at school, we had a new exchange student. Her name was Jacqueline and she came from Germany. She was half Iranian, half German. And she was my best friend for the year that she was at my school. She was a little, a little rebellious. She refused to wear a school uniform and she wore long flowing white garments. And the thing that I remember the most about Jacqueline was that she smelled absolutely beautiful. She wore this perfume that she wouldn't, she wouldn't show it to anybody, wouldn't tell anybody what it was, but it was, it was Persian and it was oil and she rubbed it into her sandals and into her bag and into her clothes, into her hair. And before you could see Jacqueline, you could smell her wafting from corridor to corridor. We're still friends and she doesn't recall what it was that was in that perfume. I, to my mind's, or to my perfumer's nose, it contains sandalwood, something that smelt like apricot, probably some frankincense, and combine that with the leather, it was the most beautiful smell. When I was in my adult years, I never got that smell, and I became very interested in perfumes. And I went on this elusive hunt to try to find something that was almost the same as Jacqueline's perfume. I came close, but I never actually found it. So perfume is something that's very dear to my heart. Um, over the years, I have had a beautiful collection of perfumes. I don't do that anymore, but I've got some exquisite perfumes from around the world that came from that quest for looking for something as beautiful as what Jacqueline wore. And so the study tonight, it really piqued my imagination of what it would have been like to have been gathered outside the sanctuary to smell the most beautiful smell that you could ever imagine wafting out of the, the doors of the sanctuary. The sanctuary invites the sinner to come as he or she is, to step into the courtyard, to be clothed with Christ's righteousness, to receive forgiveness at the altar of the brazen altar, to experience the new birth through baptism and the renewal of the Holy Spirit through the labor, and then to step inside the holy place to continue one's growth as a Christian. There are three, three items of furniture in the holy place, the table of showbread, the candlestick, and the, the altar of incense. Those three together represent the infilling or the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which enables us to minister to minister for Christ, the word of God, and prayer. The heavenly sanctuary gives us a, a, a lovely insight into the altar of incense as it is in heaven. In Revelation chapter 8, verse 3, we're told that another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And so the, alt the, incense, the altar of incense in heaven is before the throne of God. And it is used to convey the prayers of all saints of all ages to, to carry those to the throne of God. Verse 4, and the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And so incense is connected intimately with the prayers of the saints. The holy place was fragrant with the lovely name of Jesus. Jesus is the source of, of the fragrance that came from the altar of incense. Let's turn to chapter 30 of Exodus. We're told about the location of the of the altar in verse six. And thou shalt put it before the veil that is by the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat that is over the testimony where I will meet with thee. And so this is the closest article of furniture in the holy place between, that they're separated by the veil. So, it, so you've got the veil separating it from the mercy seat on the other side. 
the beautiful words are, it is where I will meet with thee. So it is there that we individually can meet with Christ at the altar. So we know exactly where it was located. It was the priest who ministered at the altar who came closest to the mercy seat on the other side of the veil. So this is as far that you could go to the mercy seat without crossing into the third chamber. We're told in Exodus 30 verse 1 that it was made of shittim or acacia wood. Solomon's altar or his, his equipment altar was made of cedar, which would have represented the wood of the promised land, but shittim wood would have represented the wood of the wilderness. We're told that it was a cubit in length, a cubit in breadth, four square, so it's a square, two cubits high shall be the height thereof, and the horns thereof shall be the same. So it's it's a square shaped figure that is twice as high as it is wide. It was the equivalent of 44 inches in height. Thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, the top thereof and the sides thereof round about, and the horns thereof, and thou shalt make unto it a crown of gold round about. So we've got here wood that is overlaid with gold. The gold represents the divinity of Jesus, and the wood represents the frailty of his humanity. The altar of incense represents Jesus as our intercessor. And so he is the son of God and he's also the son of man. And the two are represented by the gold and the wood. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17, we're told, Wherefore in all things it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in all things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. So, so Jesus, our intercessor, had to be like us and that is why he's represented by wood at the altar and so the wood is perishable but gold is imperishable the, there are four corners of the altar and each corner had a wooden horn that was also covered in gold Scripture indicates that the horns represent the power or the might of God. And when the priest held onto those, power, onto those horns, he could receive victory in battle. In Revelation, we're told that Jesus has seven horns. Revelation 5, verse, seven, verse 6. Let's turn to that. And, be, and I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. The, alt the altar had a top, a top that was likened to the rooftop of the buildings of Bible times. Around the top was a crown that was likened to a fence or a guardrail. We find in Acts chapter 10, verse nine, that Peter prayed on the rooftop. And so the, the, the top of the altar with its fence, like a crown, is a safe place for, for us to worship our God in safety. There's a guard a guardrail around it. The crown that is the crown that surrounds the top of the altar is a golden crown, and it's the crown of victory that Christ had. When he was on the cross, he wore a crown of thorns, and that represents the, the ram that was caught by its horns in the brambles in Genesis 22, verse 13. So Jesus had to wear the thorns that that Adam won for us through his sin. And by conquering the cross, he, he earned a crown of gold. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, 
we also can, if we are victorious, we will receive the crown of life. The crown that's on top of the altar also tells us that our intercessor is a king. That is indicated in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, that tells us that the government was placed upon his shoulders. And Jesus is called the king throughout Revelation and in Psalms. The altar of incense is about bring, bringing sinners and saints close to God through prayer. As, as the incense was burned on the altar, it was at waist high, and so the, prayer, the incense went up to heaven. God is represented by the Shekinah glory on the other side of the, the veil, and so prayers go up to the Shekinah. The altar of incense invites us to come boldly to the throne of grace. This can only be achieved by first applying the blood at the brazen altar and then going into the heavenly, going into the holy place. So you have to have the blood. And then we can then go confidently past the candlestick and the table of showbread, confidently to the throne of God. Hebrews 4, verse 16. The altar of incense had to burn continually with incense. It burned in the morning and night. So whenever the, the lamps were trimmed and the oil was spilled into the, into the candlestick, incense had to be continually burning on, on the altar of incense. We're told in Luke 1, verse 10, that God's people would gather at the time of incense for prayer. I'll just read that to you. So this is talking about Zacharias. According to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord, and the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. And so people gathered around the sanctuary to pray and to, to confess their sins and to rededicate themselves to God. Our greatest example of prayer is found in Jesus, who found it his joy and his comfort to be continually in communion with his Father. The sanctuary invites us to pray twice a day, morning and night, but we're told also that Daniel prayed three times a day, morning and noon and in the evening. And so it is good for us to, to have regularity in our prayer life. In the morning, we should dedicate ourselves to God. And it's a good habit to, to, re, to refresh our prayers in the middle of the day, to reconnect with God. And then again, when we go to bed. We're warned about offering strange fire. We all know the story of Isaiah in Numbers chapter 16, who, who was an arrogant king who thought that he could approach the altar of incense and he was warned by the priest not to do that. We're told by Josephus, Josephus that the perfume of the incense spread far beyond the sanctuary. It spilled right out through the camp. And to, to me, that represents that our lives are to be, are to be fragrant like Christ's. It, the, the perfume of Christ is all invading. Wherever God's people are, we should be fragrant like that. So the perfume should spill beyond the, the camp, beyond the church, beyond the home to touch the lives of many people. The coals were placed in a golden censer. The golden censer represents faith and love. The incense represents the merits and the intercession of Christ. Ellen White says that Christ, our mediator, stands before the Father to present our prayers mingled with his own merit 
and spotless righteousness as fragrant incense. No victim died on this altar, but daily the, the priest had to splash blood on its horns which, with blood that came from the sacrifices in the courtyard. In Psalm chapter 141, verse 2, David said, let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. If we go down to the next verse, set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth, keep the door of my lips, incline not my heart to any evil thing to practice wicked works with men that work iniquity and let me not eat out of their dainties. Let, let me not eat of their dainties. And so we learn from David that our prayer is like incense, but that there are conditions attached to it, that we have to be, that we have to be in submission to God, that we have to be willing to let go of any love of evil and to love righteousness, incline, incline not my heart to any evil thing, to practice, practice wicked works with men that work iniquity. So there are conditions that are attached to our prayers that we need to desire righteousness. Christ is, Christ is the fragrance. In first selected messages, first, page 333, the holy incense which makes our petitions acceptable is Christ as our fragrance, as the fragrance. Let's have a little look at the ingredients of, of the incense in Exodus chapter 30, verses 34 to 38. And the Lord said unto Moses, take unto thee sweet spices, Stacti and Onica and Galbanum, these sweet spices with pure frankincense, of each shall there be a like weight. And thou shalt make it a perfume, a confection after the art of the apothecary, tempered together, pure and holy. And thou shalt beat some of it very small and put of it before the testimony in the tabernacle of the congregation, where I will meet with thee. It shall be unto you most holy. And as for the perfume which thou shalt make, ye shall not make to yourselves according to the composition thereof. It shall be unto the it shall be unto thee holy for the Lord. Whosoever shall make like unto that, to smell thereto, shall even be cut off from his people. And so we've got five ingredients. The stacti comes from a word that means a drop. So it's thought that it was the shape of a drop, but it would have been a, a, a drop of sap. And my understanding is that this resembled myrrh and it came from the bark of a tree. By itself, stacti is a strong, bitter taste. And I, I believe that this ingredient, in, this ingredient would represent bitterness in our prayers, bitter tears and confession. By itself, it is not a very pleasant smell. It's, it's bitter and it's peppery. The onica, from what I gather, comes from a shellfish or a mollusk. And I think it's the same one that produced a, a blue dye that was used to dye garments. This ingredient by itself is not of great use either. And it's, it's a carrier, like a carrier oil. And it's used as a base note in perfumery. So it's not used by itself, it has to be used with other ingredients. It intensifies and it prolongs fragrances. So that would help, help the temple incense to, to linger. Galbanum also by itself is, is very bitter. It's a pungent green, stimulating, exciting smell, but that cannot be used by itself. And the original Ch Chanel number no. 19 from 1971, had that as its key ingredient. Galbanum would represent 
having zest and enthusiasm in our prayers. By itself, it's disagreeable, but it's, it's a beautiful ingredient to include with other ingredients. Frankincense comes from Boswellia sterata, and by itself, it is a beautiful smell. I'm sure some of you have smelt it as an oil. It's used in perfumery to, to cover other smells, and it just gives it a beautiful, beautiful note. Frankincense represents sweetness in our prayers. It, it, brings, it brings the thought of, of liveliness and springtime. It's a foresty smell. And to me, it's, it represents the living power of Jesus' name. The fifth ingredient is salt. And we're told that in Leviticus 2, verse 13, and Exodus 30, verse 34, that needed to be salted. In any offering in the sanctuary, salt was a key ingredient. In the incense, it would represent, it would re represent faith, um, faithfulness in prayer, to have faith as we pray, um, not to be wavering, as James says in James 1 verse 6, let him ask in faith, non-wavering. It also represents the divine grace, and we're told in the spirit of prophecy that that salt represents divine grace. What can we learn in today's world about, about incense and, and prayer? I think one of the things that I learned the most out of this was the most beautiful quote that I hadn't heard before from Ellen White in Gospel Workers, page 254. Prayer is the breath of the soul. It is the secret of spiritual power. No other means of grace can be substituted and the health of the soul is preserved. Prayer brings the brings to the heart so brings the heart into immediate contact with the wellspring of life it strengthens the sinew and muscle of the religious experience so prayer is the breath of the soul breath is or respiration comes automatically when we don't have any problems with our respiration life is so much easier i can say that as an asthmatic sometimes i have asthma attacks and i can tell you that that laboured breathing is, is not very pleasant and it's quite painful. But prayer should come automatically to, to God's people. It's the breath of the soul. We are to pray without ceasing. We're told that in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 16. And we're invited to be the person of Christ in 2 Corinthians 2 verse 15. Just turn to that. For we are unto God a sweet savour of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. So we can be a sweet savour of Christ, a beautiful perfume. I'll close there because it, it's quite a deep study, but I didn't want to go too deeply because I think we have go, go off on a lot of tangents. But I think the take home message for me today is that prayer is the breath of the soul, that we can approach the throne of grace with confidence through the sanctuary, through the sanctuary that is now in heaven, and that we have a mediator in Christ, that the angels present our prayers to, to God sorry to Jesus who takes them to God there's another Ellen White quote and I haven't got on hand where it says that that our prayers are, are represented by Jesus without any without any stammering or stuttering every sincere prayer is heard in heaven it may not be fluently expressed but if the heart is in it it will ascend to the sanctuary where Jesus ministers and he'll present it to the father without one awkward stammering word beautiful and fragrant with the incense of his own perfection. And that's the end of my study for tonight. Thanks, Liz. God bless. Thank you. That was lovely. Amen. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Liz, for that. It was, it was very good. Does anybody have anything they would like to ask, Liz, or...? 
comment on? Just um, on the salt lease, you said um, that in the incense had salt in it, and I can't, I can't see that in the scriptures. Can you show me where it says that? I'll have a look. Okay, I'll just look at my quotes that were salted. Yeah. Leviticus 2 verse 13 comes to mind. That's talking about the meat offering, I think. Can I get back to you next week on that because I yeah. did read it? Yeah, yeah, no worries. That's fine. Yeah. I could be wrong. <laughs> Forgive me if I'm wrong, but I thought I read that it was salted as well. Hmm. Well, I'm not saying you're wrong, but I, I just no, I when, I, when, when, when I was when I was presenting the um about the altar bird offering, the um the meal offerings or grand offerings, they had to certainly be with salt. But um, as I said, I am um, so certainly salt is there somewhere, as you would say, as you said. <laughs> but I'll yeah. double check it, and I'll tell you next week if I'm right or wrong. Okay. Yeah, good, that's fine. Yes. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, thank you. This is Yurek. Uh, my question is, where would they get all those ingredients being on in a desert, like from shell and so on? I think a lot of it would have come from Egypt. Or probably they carried with them when they I came. Think so. I think so. Because because you think of how they mummified, they, they would have had a lot of spices mm. and perfumes. Like, the Egyptians were, were wonderful perfumers. And they bought quite a lot of things out of Egypt, didn't they? I mean, they had, as, as somebody said in their presentation, the, the labour was made out of the mirrors of the women. So, I mean, they, they would have to brought them with them, I would, no doubt, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, that was least. <laughs> I was thinking, was it? Yes, okay, yes. Mm. Yeah. I was wondering... I was wondering if there was any chance for them to actually have had any trade with other people, any nomadic trade with some, they might have come across some other people. Hmm. Yeah, there would have been trade, wouldn't it? I doubt it. No, okay. I, I could be wrong, but I imagine that God would have kept, kept his people away from yeah. other influences. Hmm. Yeah, that's true too. Yeah, that's true. Mm. And that 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 um incense had to be burnt, was basically burnt all the way up until the time of Christ. So they must have had the ingredients for that, or well, the priests must have handed those ingredients, like the uh, priests of the showbread, mm -hmm. the priest, the ingredients of the showbread, must have been handed down or, or written down somewhere for the um. For only only for the priests to um to read and see what had how these things had to be to be made so mm. they would have had to have access to that product from the time they left Egypt up until the time of Christ mm. and they weren't allowed to replicate it no that's right yeah. what was the verse after gospel workers uh, 254. I'll just have a look. You mean the one about um, prayer being the breath of life? The breath of... You had gospel workers and then the next verse, I, I missed it. And the following verse was 2 yeah. Corinthians 15. 2 Corinthians 15. So it's in between, there was another verse. Oh, was, it, was it James 1 6? I think it was. James 1 6. James 1 6. Let him ask in faith, none wavering. There was something else. You had the verse Gospel Workers 254, yes? Mm -hmm. You've got this one? And first Thessalonians 5 16. Oh, yeah, that will yeah. be. Which yeah. one? First Thessalonians? First Thessalonians 5 verse 16. Without ceasing, is it? Yeah. yeah. That's the verse. Thank you. Well, it's a big blessing to share all these things. Mm -hmm. I looked up about the salt. Um, it says that the 
offering is of incense also had to be seasoned with salt, but that may be just according to tradition. So I don't know whether there's anything in scripture about it, but apparently, at least according to tradition, it was with salt. So uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and that would give it a, a certain smell as well. Yeah. I'd, I'd like to ask you about um, Isaiah chapter 6. Because I was thinking about this, but I don't have all the answers. Isaiah 6. Isaiah chapter 6. Let's start with let's start with verse six. In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood seraphims, each one had six wings, with twain he covered his face, with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. He laid it on my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched my lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. So that would be from the altar of incense, I presume, in heaven. Mm. Yeah, no, to be honest. Any thoughts? And, and, and verse chapter, sorry, verse four, the house was filled with smoke. Is that the smoke from, from the incense? Or is there a separate smoke that comes from the father? I thought that was more the, um, the presence as opposed to the actual incense. But that's just my interpretation. It'd be good, it maybe good to look at what when you, what the original words used for smoke there is, what it means. As it, and when we look at the like the, as you say the the, the um, cloud that fills the temple, whether that's the same word used there or not. That's some mm -hmm. homework, <laughs> maybe. Lise, Lise, Lise. Uh, if you go to uh, Exodus chapter thirty mm -hmm. and verse fifteen. And the Bible says, and thou shalt make it a perfume, confections after the art of the apothecary, uh, tempted together, pure and holy. That mm -hmm. word tempter, mm -hmm. if you look in the, uh, what you call the Hebrew, it means salted. There you go. Ah. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Lavina. Yes, it's, yes, it's often good to go back to the original, isn't it, to find out what it means. Yeah. Michael, did you hear it? Yes, I did. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Lavina. Um, I was also thinking, but I, I didn't have time to, to go down this, this line of thought. And it would make a really good second study. And that's about how prayer actually works, how it works in heaven. Yes. And, and yes. I, was, I was made curious about that. From Revelation chapter eight, because it's the it's the angel who has the golden censer, not not Jesus. Jesus is the high, high priest. And I was thinking, why is it that the angel has the censer? Lost you, Liz. Sorry. Well, Ellen White. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Well, you you is you said why does the angel have the censer? Well, actually, I don't know whether this is related at all, but. Somewhere Ellen White talks about that there are certain heavenly beings that also have part in the intercession of prayer with um, in, as part of their ministry. So I don't, I can't tell you where it comes from, but in some way they are also involved with the prayers of saints. So that may have, may or not, may or may not have had something to do with what you're saying. I don't know. It, it appears to be, doesn't it? 
yeah, I think well, I, I think I found that if people have got um, Austin Cook's book on an enduring vision, I think I read that in somewhere in his book. Um, he bought. If you say forgot that one, I think it's in there somewhere. I think this altar in Isaiah six is the altar of um. It is the altar of incense because there wouldn't have been an altar of burnt offering in heaven. No. So it would have to be the altar of incense, because the altar of incense is always going. So the so the smell has to um keep perfuming out of the altar. So there has to be flame there to keep the uh the perfume uh, going, so to speak. So, so that's my, where I, yes. My question is, I mean, well, it, it, the, 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 the burning is actually in the sensor itself though, isn't it? That right? Well, the, yeah, that's when the, the sense, that's when the, on the day of atonement. But I'm just saying, well, are you saying whether things burnt on the altar of, of, um, Oh, oh, what, what, what are we talking about now? The altar, altar of incense. Altar of incense. Are you saying that there was burning on that besides or apart from the altar, the part of the sensor, or is, is the sensor where it's burnt? Is my yeah, but what, what the sensor is a separate thing to the altar, isn't it? Well, it that's is. what I'm saying. That, it's a it, carrying that's, container. Sorry? It's a car isn't it just a carrying container? Oh, like, what? Sorry? It, I thought it was like, like in the Catholic Church when they've got the thing that they swing, I thought that was the yeah. sensor. And so that's got the coals in it. And yeah. I imagine they carried the coals in the sensor onto the altar. I could be wrong. Well, that, that's my question. Is that, is that why that's, is that, that's, that's the source of the coals for the burning on the altar of incense? So there's oh, no yeah. other vessel. Is there no other vessel on the altar of incense apart from the sensor that's burning? I don't is think my so. Question. Sorry? Hmm. I don't think so. No, what's no. that? No, yes, that's okay. That's what I was thinking. Yes, I was wondering. Yeah, yeah. but the the altar of incense has got the sense on it where the yeah. where it's burning from. Yeah, that's right. Yep, yep. And Isaiah six would tell us that, that there are tongs involved in picking up the the live coals off the altar as well. It's because a lot of those different things we look at, they had their various instruments or vessels, don't they, associated with the furniture? Yeah, yeah. And, the, and again, the holy, the heavenly sanctuary is, even though the earthly sanctuary is a, a pattern and a type, obviously the heavenly sanctuary is, is, um, is a lot different in some aspects, you know, I mean, it's still got all those, those things in it, but, um, but it's, it's still, um, it's still not the same, so to speak. So I suppose the altar, the um, the altar in old incense in heaven is probably a little bit different to the one that was here on earth, even though it was meant as it's meant to be the same thing. I'm probably confusing myself saying this, <laughs> but yeah, we, we know that the it's different to a certain extent than it's different because the altar of um so, for instance, the Ark of the Covenant in heaven, uh, it wouldn't have Aaron's rod and it wouldn't have the manna and it wouldn't have the book of the law in, beside it. But it would it still got the Ten Commandments. So, yeah. so in that way, they're, they're a little bit, bit different to the ones here on, on earth. Well, mm. I, I found out in my studies that... Um, even by the time of Solomon's temple, there was nothing in the Ark of the Covenant except the, the law of the table. So they did, they disappeared. Other things had disappeared by that time, apparently. Well, they shouldn't have. They should have still well, been you, in there. It's, I, if, I, if you, if you and, and Sabbath morning, there's two references to I, saying in, by the time of Solomon's temple, there, all that was contained in the Ark of the Covenant was the two tables in Solomon's temple. And there's, really? two, there's two scripture references that, that say it's that, that it's so. So, so that's a foretaste of Sabbath morning at 9 30. Mm, okay. <laughs> yes. No worries. Interesting. <laughs> Lavina, did you want to say something? No, no, no. Oh, okay. But it shows the importance of prayer. And I think we all, to a certain extent, maybe some more than others, don't, don't, 
appreciate and realize how how powerful and how how important prayer is for for each and every one of us. We need to pray more and pray differently, I think. Mm. Pray, yeah. We need to pray that our lips will be touched with a live call from the altar. Yeah. Uh, I just, uh, just add a little bit. Uh, when you go to the Hebrews, the original language, that frequency means whiteness in the Hebrew language. So, um, our prayers had to, uh, you know, um, go together or communicate with uh, or present it in the righteousness of Christ in order for, for our prayers to be accepted by God. Amen. And it, we know that it goes through the Holy Spirit and it goes through Christ before it gets to the Father. So by the time it gets there, it's probably a whole lot better than what, what we're praying. <laughs> Yeah. Isn't, it, isn't it amazing that our prayers are translated basically well i think you know, we can be glad about that you know sometimes and sometimes if I, you know if you're like me you sort of don't know exactly you, you have a situation which you don't want to pray about but you don't necessarily know what to ask for for the best so i think it may, also at those times i think you know our prayers can be made um perfect because we don't know exactly what's for the best do we mm -hmm. I'm sure we've all read the chapter in Steps of Christ called On the Privilege of Prayer. I think that'd be a another pertinent time to go to go read that chapter. I think it's the longest chapter in Steps of Christ. Oh, yeah. Repentance, repentance might be. It's I think it's between those two two chapters, but it's a long chapter. Yes. What is there any more questions or comments or will we stop the recording? Stop recording. Stop recording? Okay. <laughs>